All right, good morning and welcome to Unit 6, Chapter 6. This is Learning. And I know some of you may think, hey, didn't we already do Learning? We talked about memory. This is different. Um, learning has a very uh, specific definition in psychology, and it's not memorization. And then you start to think, well, isn't that mostly what we do in school? Well, yeah, kind of. Uh, but you're going to see that learning is its own separate thing. And the interesting thing about this unit is going to be uh, this might be the unit that requires the most application, meaning you don't just know the term, you have to be able to use the term. We're going to give you scenarios and see, is this what's happening here or not? So uh, we'll see how this goes for you. All right, so the first thing we're going to do, what we would do in class, is uh, we would discuss something. I'll show you a little, um, a little excerpt on the next slide. Uh, but I like this cartoon. It says, the ears hear the can opener right away. The stomach knows that supper is coming. How do the ears tell the stomach? I've never been able to figure that out. We have a cat. We got a cat during COVID. And every night at eight, my daughter feeds her uh, snacks. And as soon as the cat hears that plate, cat comes running. So that's learning. That's a change in behavior. But we're going to talk about um, what learning might look like. Here are a couple of things that we would look at on the, the handout 6-2 that was referenced on the previous slide. So a question for you. A computer program generates random opening moves for its first 100 chess games and tabulates the outcomes of those games. Starting with the 101st game, the computer uses those tabulations to influence its choice of opening moves. So the question for you is, did the computer learn? <clears throat> I mean, we don't know learning yet, but we're going to learn the definition, and then I want to see, uh, learn the definition. We'll memorize the definition, but then we'll apply it. Is that learning? We'll find out. So go ahead and just lock in your answer. Let's look at the next one. A worm is placed in a tea maze. The left arm of the maze is brightly lit and dry. The right arm is dim and moist. On the first 10 trials, the worm turns right seven times. On the next 10 trials, the worm turns right all 10 times. So the question is, is that learning? Did the worm learn? In the previous scenario, did the computer learn? Well, let's take a look. What is learning? It's a process through which experience produces lasting change in behavior or mental processes. So experience produces a change. All right. But there are a few things that it's not. We'll talk about in a minute. The book says the process of acquiring new and relatively enduring information or behaviors. I don't love this. I think this makes better. Experience produces a change. Um, so then the question is, did the computer have an experience and did the experience produce change? Did the worm have experiences which produce change? Well, let's talk about that. First of all, we'll tell you what it can't be. Uh, the behavior can't be at what's called a native response tendency or an instinct. Um, Instincts aren't learned, like a salmon swimming upstream, the swallows returning to Capistrano. That's not learning. That's just an instinct. Uh, maturation. Uh, children grow up. They, they do things at um, certain times, and every child does it. So when they walk, that is just part of the maturation process. So we technically wouldn't say that they learned because that's just part of the maturation process. And then we don't say that um, an experience produces a lasting change in behavior. Uh, we wouldn't call temporary states like fatigue if your behavior changes because you're fatigued. Probably a better example, if your behavior changes because you're on drugs. Uh, that is not a lasting change. Um, and even if you take too much drugs and you blow your brains, you know, and you're just kind of a, an acid burnout, um, that's still not learning. So um, we wouldn't call it that. So learning is an experience or experiences that produce a lasting change in behavior or mental processes. So let's think back. Did the computer learn? Yes. It had 100 experiences, and on the 101st, it changed its behavior based on the experiences. Now, does a computer behave? Sure, absolutely. It, it makes decisions, um, what, how it's going to move that chess piece. Uh, did the worm learn? Did experience produce a lasting change in behavior? Yes. The first 10 trials, it learned which one to go to. In the second 10 trials, it changed its behavior, and it improved. So that's what we did. We just looked back, and we saw that those were both examples of learning. If we had time in class, we'd do all 10, but we don't have time in class. Who knows? We may be in hybrid by the time you watch this video, so maybe we will do it in class. Okay. 
Um, we will not learn about instincts. Those were um, natural response tendencies. They are innate and not learned. We will not learn about maturation. And in fact, we're going to learn about maturation in the development chapter. And we're going to learn stages of maturity, how, how children mature, how even adults mature. Uh, so that, that's separate. That's not learning. And then memory. Memory is a different type of learning. I mean, I'm not saying it's not learning, but that's not what we're talking about here. We already did that in cognition. Okay, so let's talk about the simplest type of learning. The simplest type of learning is habituation. We've already talked about that. Uh, the video that we showed was the rat in the cage and there would be a very loud noise and the rat would start to shrink from it. And after a while, the experience of hearing those loud noises would produce a lasting change in behavior because the rat would stop flinching. So that is very simple. That's not complex learning at all. It's just getting used to stuff. And all creatures get used to stuff. Um, you know, single cell organisms get used to stuff. It just that just happens. So uh, that's another thing to uh, just stop for a second. You don't need a brain to learn. You can teach worms. You can teach, I mean, literally amoebas. Um, anything that, that can move, if you shock it at a certain spot, it will avoid that spot. That is learning. An experience of a shock produces a change in behavior. Whatever organisms are getting shocked, learn not to go to that spot any longer. Um, associative learning, we'll talk about that later on, um, in which we associate, we're gonna, or we're gonna talk about associative learning, um, but we'll talk more about that later on. Um, when we do associative learning, we're associating two things. Think back to that Snoopy cartoon we looked at at, at the beginning. Um, we had the tone and uh, the sound of the of the can being opened, whatever it is, and the animal said, "Oh gosh, food is coming." Um, here's the interesting thing um, that, well, yeah, I'll talk about it right now. Um, the guy who discovered associative learning, I shouldn't say discovered it, but really started to study it first, won the Nobel Prize, but he wasn't a psychologist. He um, was studying the digestion of dogs, and he would have dogs hooked up to gather their saliva when they ate. I know it sounds gross, um, but he wanted to find out how they digested food. But the problem was they started salivating when they heard the food being opened and he's like stop 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 don't salivate yet i want to wait until you eat and, he's like, oh. and then they started salivating when they heard footsteps even coming into the room because they knew food was coming and he was at least smart enough ivan pavlov was smart enough to say okay maybe i can't study digestion but this is something even more interesting and this is how do we associate two things and behavior and consequences if i held up a squirt gun to you and squirted you in the face it would take one time before i held up a squirt gun again and you would flinch that is a change in behavior uh, from experience i also do this thing in class i would do and maybe i'll do it when we're back together is i would hold up an air horn and it's super loud and i would i would blast it for a second and people would they would be startled and then um, later in the class i would just grab the air horn and put it up and so many other people in the class would do that you have learned now you, i mean that's not something you learn in school but that is what we're talking about with psychological learning where we associate two things um, then we're going to talk about behavioral learning, where we're going to talk about rewards and punishments. Um, really, we're, when we get to classical and operant conditioning, it's really important that we separate those two. And we, it's really important that we put those two together and we separate those from cognitive learning. If I tell you um, that the capital of Texas is Austin, you have learned that cognitively, but that's not the kind of learning that we're talking about here, behavioral learning. And really, when you look at the term, as Mr. Davis always says, the term sort of defines itself. Uh, we see behaviors and um, uh, behaviors change due to experience. And this little uh, square right here, this is going to be a video from the office, which many of you have seen. Um, and we're going to pause and show you this video here in a minute. There's another great video we're going to show you on the next slide. Uh, but I want to leave you with this. B.F. Skinner, who basically was the man who spent a lot of time um, popularizing and studying what's called operant conditioning, and we'll get to it. Really, most of this unit is called behaviorist learning. How do we um, change behavior through stimulus and response? And he said, and this is scary as heck. And I will tell you something too. When you think about this, this is your cell phone in your pocket. 
and we can talk about this a little bit more. But B.F. Skinner said our concern should be behavior because behavior can be measured. I, B. Skinner said I don't care what's going on in here because I, don't, I won't be able to see what's going on in here. I can only see what you do. So a behavior is said we should only study behavior. Makes sense. Behavior studies behavior. But he said the methods should be objective, not introspective. And I like that too. I'm going to move that up here. In other words, I'm not going to ask you what you're thinking to introspect. I'm going to watch what you do. I'm going to watch your behavior. And the last thing, and this should really scare you because we're living in Skinner's world right now. The goal should be, quote, the prediction and control of behavior rather than understanding of mental events. And he started to realize, I can predict and to a great degree control your behavior. And I want to tell you something. Um, your social media accounts and your phones are predicting and controlling your behavior right now. They are using Skinner's philosophies to a great degree. We can talk about that more in class, but this is a perfect place for me to leave you after 11 minutes.